We are here at the Ono Academic College Israel during the international conference dealing with traditional knowledge and access to knowledge and access to medicine. And I'm happy to present uh, Mr. Wen Wenlen, um, who is the head of the Division of Traditional Knowledge at World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, at Geneva. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, let's uh, start with the, the first question, like, what is traditional knowledge? It refers to the knowledge systems of indigenous peoples and other local tribes and groups around the world. Um, and this knowledge tends to be collectively owned. It tends to be reflective of their identity. It's evolving. Uh, and because of its age and the fact that it's collectively owned, uh, it's often not protected by the conventional intellectual property system. Can you give some examples for uh, traditional knowledge? Uh... It is found in very many diverse fields. And on the one side of the spectrum, one would talk about folklore or traditional cultural expressions. These are uh, expressions of knowledge and culture that are manifested in the form of music, dance, design, architecture and symbols. Um, and there are many examples uh, in which indigenous music or symbols or designs have been what we call misappropriated or used by third parties in, a, in, a, in the wrong context from the indigenous uh, point of view. The other end of the spectrum is what we call technical knowledge, a knowledge related and know-how related to biodiversity, um, healthcare, agriculture, and so on. And again, there are examples of where uh, pharmaceutical companies and other companies have exploited the knowledge, have developed inventions, drugs, for example, and patented them without the indigenous peoples being aware. Okay, with uh, the menorah, the Israeli Jewish symbol, or the David Shield, would, would it be considered as a traditional knowledge? What do you think? Well, it depends on the definition of uh, traditional knowledge, of course. But again, if you go back to the definition I gave earlier, it's part of identity, collectively owned and evolving. I would say that some of these symbols, theoretically, yes, could fall within the definition. I think the question from an intellectual property point of view, however, is are these symbols liable to misappropriation in the intellectual property sense? Because you only need an intellectual property type of protection if these symbols are being copied and commercialized in the intellectual property sense. It's very clear that there's aspects of intangible cultural heritage, including symbols such as those that you've mentioned, that ought to be preserved because they are reflective of identity and one wants to maintain the link between the religion and the symbol. But whether they need intellectual property protection, that's a separate question. Can you elaborate? Uh, what, what is WIPO doing in order to protect this traditional knowledge problem? Well, WIPO is a part of the UN system. We're a specialized agency in the UN system. Uh, we have member states that are our clients, that, are, that run WIPO. They set the program and budget and the objectives of WIPO. Um, and essentially what, the, what my division does uh, in the TK field is we do two things. We facilitate an international negotiation that is taking place between the member states uh, who have decided that they want to discuss the development of an international legal instrument that would provide an intellectual property-like protection for traditional knowledge. And when we facilitate that process, uh, we don't have a view, of course, it's the member states who decide, who, who have the views, it's up to them to decide finally on the content of the instrument. But we prepare the documentation and we help the member states to understand the different issues and options that lie before them. The second thing we do is we capacity build. So we strengthen capacity in countries to establish effective national systems. Uh, and we work with many governments around the world and indigenous peoples who are trying to understand the issues better, including the use of the existing IP system, because that can also provide some protection for TK. And what are uh, the main challenges to, in your work? What are the difficulties that you're facing? There'd be a number of procedural challenges, challenges to do with participation in the process. Of course, we want all the member states to be involved. They all are involved. But indigenous peoples, as the holders of TK systems, 
need to be involved in as well. So participation is one of the issues. Substantively, um, there's still um, not complete agreement on a number of core questions. What is traditional knowledge? So the what question. Uh, why should it be protected? What is the rationale and the justification for protecting TK? And what would the consequences, intended and unintended, be of a new system of protection? Who should benefit from the protection? Member states have very different views about the, the role of the state, for example. Um, should indigenous peoples be the direct rights holders themselves, or should the state own the rights or hold the rights and manage them on their behalf? And then finally, the question of what kind of protection would be appropriate. Should, it, should TK be given a copyright-like or a patent-like right, uh, like an exclusive right, or should it be rather a system of compensation and acknowledgement, uh, which is also, of course, possible in the IP system. So these are the main questions, the why, the what, the who, and the how. And now, can you give an example of, of the how? Like, how can we really protect uh, some, I don't know, songs or some agricultural plants being used by uh, firms and like for medicine or uh, for, I don't know, commercial songs. Like, how, how can it be protected if it's like well known all over and it's public domain already? Well, public domain, of course, is a controversial concept in this area because these expressions and knowledge systems are public domain from the perspective of the Western IP system, but they're not public domain from the perspective of the, of the in, in indigenous peoples because they have their own customary legal systems that create private domains and, and they don't believe in the public domain concept. Um, but let's, the, one of the problems is indeed that it's publicly available knowledge. It's knowledge that has already been published in textbooks and in databases and on the internet. The one approach, uh, there are many approaches, but the one approach is to vest an exclusive property right in TK. And that would mean that a, a pharmaceutical company or a fashion designer that wishes to use some aspect of folklore or TK would need first the prior and informed consent of the indigenous people or group before it could use the knowledge systems or the folklore. This is potentially difficult in practice because, as you said, much of the knowledge has been published already and it might be difficult to identify from whom to get the consent and it might actually stifle creativity. Another approach might be to not have an exclusive right, so to allow people to be inspired by other people's TK and folklore, but to ensure that third-party users or second-comers do two things, or three things in fact. If they use someone else's TK, they acknowledge the source, so that's a sign of respect that one was inspired by the work of so-and-so people. Secondly, they don't distort the original TK or expression of folklore. They don't misuse it in a way that would be offensive to the indigenous people concerned. And thirdly, that if benefits are generated from the use of the TK or folklore, that the benefits are shared in some way. And that kind of a system, kind of a moral rights plus benefit sharing system, which is found in some other non-IP systems uh, and is also rooted in the IP system, might strike the right kind of balance. So the last question will be, uh, how did you get to this field of, of traditional knowledge? Well, I'm an IP lawyer by background and I believe in the IP system. I believe that innovation is good for human welfare and I believe in that one should recognize and protect the innovation of human beings. So I believe in the rationale of the IP system. Um, but I think it's uh, well known that the IP system, its credibility is, is in question these days. The copyright system, the patent system is criticized from various angles. And I think that the, uh, the possibility of the IP system broadening its understanding of what is intellectual property, that is not simply the creations that were envisaged at the time that the IP system was developed in Western Europe in the 1800s, the late, and late 19th century, I think if one could broaden the understanding of what IP is, that's good for the IP system. It would be good for the credibility of the IP system, 
for it to recognize new beneficiaries, including indigenous peoples that are creators, although they create in perhaps different ways to that as was envisaged by the founders of the IP system. Okay, it was fascinating. <laughs> I'm sure you are the right person for, for the job, so uh, I wish you good luck and we are looking forward to see what will be the consent by different countries. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>